Um, Professor Sylvan Smith uh, did his uh, PhD uh, at ETH Zurich. And uh, after his PhD, uh, he did postdoc in Technical University of Denmark, where he later became also assistant professor and associate professor in the Department of Micro and Nanotechnology. In 2016, uh, he moved to uh, University of Vienna, Technical University of Vienna, in the Institute of Sensor and Equator System, where he became uh, full professors. He obtained uh, quite a number of uh, research grants. Uh, notable to mention is the uh, 2016, he got a ERC grants, and then uh, 2019, also he got a, a ERC grant. And, um, I also found that 2019, Professor Smith has co-founded a company. It's called Invisible Light Labs. So I think it's quite interesting. Um, yes, uh, Professor Smith, it's uh, for you now. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Sipasis. Well, it's a great honor to be invited to this webinar. Thank you very much to the organizers, Professor Michel Oret and Professor Frank Kichos. As a mechanical engineer, uh, I still always feel a little bit ex as an exotic foreigner uh, in the field of photonics, despite the fact that in recent years, optomechanics has grown into a major research field in physics. But while optomechanics is based on the exceptional force sensitivity of nanomechanical resonators, sensitive enough to detect the moment of momentum of photons, in our group, we have been exploiting the remarkable temperature sensitivity of nanomechanical resonators sensitive enough to detect the photothermal heating of single molecules. And so I am excited to present to you today our mechanics point of view to the field of photothermal microscopy and spectroscopy. And, and before we start, I would like to acknowledge the funding we have received from the European Research Council, which has supported the research uh, I can present today. Well, the motivation of photothermal microscopy is obvious to all of you in the audience. It is that the scattering cross section uh, scattering cross section of a particle scales with the volume to the power of two while the absorption cross section scales with the volume to the power of one and hence it is favorable to measure the absorption for particles that are smaller than roughly 100 nanometers this is a gold nanoparticle and the question is, how do we create a microscope that doesn't detect scattering, but a microscope that is absorption based? And I think the most fundamental and most uh, straightforward way is represented by the work and this paper of Professor Sandok Dar's group, where they measured the absorption directly. And here, this is a transmission measurement of a, of a single molecule, and the team was able to detect a few missing photons out of millions of probing photons in order to create the signal from here, the single molecule. Another approach, and of course, uh, this is well known here in, in, this, uh, in this field, is uh, uh, spearheaded by the group of Professor Michel Orit. And here, the photothermal signal is measured instead of the absorption signal in a transmission measurement. Here, the sample is heated up with a pump laser and the photothermal heating in the vicinity of the probe or the single molecule here is then detected with a single uh, probe laser. But wouldn't it be great to be able to detect the absorption and the photothermal signal directly? And this is what uh, can be done with a mechanical sensor. Here, this is an old paper from 1994 and this paper discussed also proved experimentally that it's possible to have a very highly or a very sensitive um, sensor when uh, that can detect minute amounts of absorbed light. This sensor was a micro, micro cantilever made of silicon nitride that was covered with a thin layer of aluminum. This creates a B material system. If then the light was hitting an absorbing layer, which can also be an absorbing sample, doesn't matter. In this case, in this schematic, it's a layer. The absorbed light, the photothermal heating, will then heat up the entire structure. 
And since the aluminum has a larger thermal expansion coefficient than silicon nitride, this will create here this moment that will bend the cantilever. And the bending, this then scales directly with the amount of absorbed light. The authors were able to show that it's possible to reach a sensitivity of 10 picowatts, which is remarkable. This is where we come in. And instead of measuring the bending of a cantilever, we are working with mechanical resonators. And in particular, with these archetypical resonators. On the left side, you can see a string. And on the right side, you can see a drum. And here are the macroscopic equivalent uh, objects that you know from everyday life. And indeed, our nanomechanical structures uh, behave exactly the same way like the macroscopic structures. There's no difference. It's just that they're smaller, faster, and uh, hence, usually more sensitive. So a string is really the same thing like a string that you know from a violin or from a piano. And the drum is exactly the same thing like we, that you know from a drum, from a drum kit, like a snare drum. Since we work with resonators, we want to look now at the equation of motion of a resonator. And it's obvious that changes of the parameter of the resonator will, have, will influence the behavior of the resonator. And this is a way we can use the resonator as a sensor. Most, uh, or very famously, changes of mass, of course, influence the frequency of a resonator, and hence, changes of mass uh, can, well, this can be used as, that, therefore, nanomechanical resonators are often used as mass sensors. It's also possible to measure changes of the damping coefficient, which corresponds to energy loss. Of course, the mechanical resonator also uh, responds to the driving force. And this, of course, is the basic mechanism of optomechanics, where the, that is based on measuring small forces of optical systems. In our group, we have specialized on measuring uh, changes of parameter k, which is the spring constant. And the spring constant for us is interesting because it is highly affected by temperature. This allows us basically to create the highly sensitive thermometer. And here you see schematically how this works. You see schematically a string resonator. We then place a sample on top of the string resonator and the sample acts as an absorber. We then usually build an oscillator circuit and we monitor the oscillation frequency or the resonance frequency here over time. At some point, we will then illuminate the sample with our laser or, or also incoherent light is for that matter, doesn't matter so much. And the absorber will now photothermally heat up, transfer the heat to the string and the string again will expand due to the thermal, thermal, uh, thermal expansion. And this expansion of the string causes a reduction of the tensile stress of the string. Musicians from, uh, under you are familiar with this effect that if you take your instrument, for example, from a warm room out to a winter day where you have to give a concert, you typically have to retune your instrument, which is exactly this effect. And we use this effect to, uh, to measure how much light is absorbed or how much heat is absorbed. And indeed, the frequency detuning scales linearly with the amount of absorbed light. Here, we see a formula for the eigenfrequency of a string, which uh, depends, of course, on the mode number, the length of the string, the mass density. And all of these parameters usually do not change. But what changes here is sigma. And sigma is the tensile stress. So again, tensile stress here is a function of the absorbed power. We can then uh, write down our responsivity we determine the responsivity of our mechanical sensor as the relative frequency change per unit absorbed power. And we are able then to determine a sensitivity, which we give as noise equivalent power, as the frequency noise, which is given as the Allen deviation, sigma tau, divided by the responsivity. Hence, what we want to achieve is 
a really low, uh, low frequency noise and a highest possible responsivity. A key effect of our structure is that the string itself is transparent to the light and only the absorber is actually heating. In this case, in this scenario, we actually detect only the absorbed photons and not the missing photons, which is typically an easier task. When I started at the technical, as a postdoc at the Technical University of Denmark in the group of Anya Boysen, we took silicon nitride strings, you can see here, a little SEM image of such a string, which is a lot longer, but it's just a little a snapshot, which we covered with polystyrene particles. We then took a red laser and scanned along the length of the string. And every time the laser spot moves across a particle, the particle will heat up, heat up the string, and the string will detune in frequency. So you can see here, this is the scan distance versus the frequency of the string resonator. And every time we hit the particle, we get a dip in the frequency. And if it's an agglomerate, like for example, this guy here, we get a larger dip. We were also actually able to perform some very rough spectroscopy with these particles. These were blue polystyrene particles. We chose blue because we had we were working with a commercial laser Doppler vibrometer with a built-in laser at the wavelength of uh, 633 nanometers. So we were smart enough to put blue particles on there where we were sure they would absorb a lot. So, and then indeed, if we then illuminated these particles with green, red, or blue LED light, we could record this very rough vis spectrum of these particles. And here we calculated that the signal was produced by roughly 30 polystyrene nanoparticles. Later, we also showed that it's possible to analyze and scan plasmonic absorbers. For this reason, we fabricated plasmonic gold nanorods. Uh, basically, we covered the silicon nitride string with gold and then fipped everything away but the little nanorod, or we fipped little slits into the gold layer. Here we can see photothermal scans of such a slit when the probing laser light was polarized here perpendicular to the slit orientation or parallel to the slit. And we can also see that we get a polarization or polarization dependent signal. And here the signal of this intensity map is given by the relative frequency detuning of the mechanical resonator. We then uh, moved on and wanted to create a more practical sensor. And therefore, we took a sample that we wanted to analyze and we nebulized it. Then we were flushing this nebulized sample. You can see here the little droplets or particles through an orifice in the chip. And they would then deposit very efficiently on the string because we were able to accelerate them very fast, so fast that they were actually impinging on the string and we were not no longer limited by diffusion. You can see here how this looks like. We can see here the string, which uh, the, the string here, which is silicon nitride. Uh, here we see the orifice and the silicon chip. And if we zoom in, we can see that the chip is covered with something. And if we zoom in a bit further, we can see these are nanoparticles. If we then, for example, sample my cells and illuminate the sampled my cells with monochromatic infrared light here coming from a quantum cascade laser, we are then able to record an absorption spectrum of what's sitting on the string, in this case, the my cells. Here we see the wave number versus frequency detuning in red. So the red curve is the measured frequency detuning of the string that contains the biomedical micelles. As a comparison, we also recorded a standard FTIR a transmission spectrum uh, of the same micelles here in black. So the main difference here is that the red curve has 1 million times less sample, and it was acquired 300 times faster and this is because in order to get enough sample for the FTIR, we had to freeze dry the micelles, which were in aqueous solution. 
And for sampling them on the string, we would sample them directly, nebulize them directly out of the aqueous solution. Within five minutes, we had enough sample on the string to then record this spectrum. In this way, we were able to analyze uh, synthetic nanoparticles. We did also pharmaceuticals here uh, a few years ago, and also thin films. And you can already see here that there's a change that happened. And the big change is that we moved in the course uh, of these experiments from the strings, which are very sensitive, to drums. The drums are naturally a bit less sensitive because the, they are thermally better connected to the frame, but they give us a bigger area to work with. So it's easier to focus a big IR spot, but it's also easier to actually make a nice scan. And this is what we used here when we arrived, when I arrived in Vienna and we started uh, our first experiments. And this uh, was Miao at the time who was working with silicon nitride drums. We placed the gold nanoparticle or multiple particles on the drum. In this case, again, we used this um, commercial laser Doppler vibrometer with a fixed laser wavelength of 633 nanometers. The cool thing about this laser Doppler vibrometer is that it can scan. So we were able to scan across the drum. And if the laser, when the laser hits now a particle, the particle will heat up and detune the drum's frequency. Here you can see some raw data, how this looks like. We have here on the y-axis, the frequency versus the scan position as a function here of time. So you can see we were dwelling on each scan point for about a second when we, until we moved on. If we then integrate and make a background correction, we get a signal that's a bit more cleaned up that looks like this. Here we have now the relative frequency change versus position in micrometers. And if we then stitch all these scan lines together, we get a beautiful 2D scan, in this case of 10 nanometer gold particles. When we look at the responsivity uh, of such a drum, we can see that it scales with inversely with the tensile stress. And this is one of the levers that we had to tune to our favor. But when we create silicon nitride, we create this in a furnace, in an LPCVD furnace, and there it's really hard to adjust the tensile stress. So then what we came up with was this method. Basically, we took a silicon nitride, which has a tensile stress uh, by nature. Then we put it in a O2 plasma, and the O2 plasma oxidizes the surface and creates a silicon oxynitride and even silicon dioxide. And this created oxide has a very high compressive stress. And this thin layer on the surface with this high compressive stress counteracts the tensile stress of the silicon nitride. And this allows us then to very specifically tailor the tensile stress of the drum to our needs. Here we can see our tensile stress as a function of the measured responsivity. And indeed, as the model predicts, we get a really nice inverse correlation between the stress and the responsivity. So we used this and we tested this with the 10 nanometer gold particles. Here we can see this the drum detuning frequency. And we started with 30 megapascal nominal, nominal stress. We get a signal that looks like this when we scan across the particle with a Gaussian beam. Then we took the, the drum with the particle on, put it in the plasma, detuned it to 6 megapascal to 1.2 megapascal. And when we plot all these values here, tensor stress versus responsivity, we get again this beautiful inverse relationship where you can see points 1, 2, and 3 corresponding to these experimental values. And you can also see that if we now, knowing the responsivity, and we know uh, the Allen deviation that we can expect, we can estimate what's the smallest detectable absorption cross-section here on the y-axis to the right. And on the right, we see here, we get into the, the regime of cross-sections that correspond to single molecules. So this motivated us to just try it. And we put uh, ATO-633 dye molecules on our drum, and we were scanning the drum and we got signals. We get here signal one, two, and three, we also got a reference speed signal here, 
and um, we chose the Alto 633 first because it has an absorption at the laser wavelength of our commercial tool, but also it allowed us, of course, to make a fluorescent microscopy reference measurement to test also that indeed these are actually single molecules and uh, not multiples. This worked really well. If you then sit down and send, uh, calculate the sensitivity, we can uh, measure the Allen deviation and we can measure the responsivity. And this gives us a noise equivalent power of about a few tenths of femtowatt per square root hertz. So this is a significant improvement over the 10 picowatts uh, that was uh, measured with the cantilever some uh, decades ago. When we then place multiple gold particles on the drum, we can record the plot the measured cross sections versus the diamond, uh, diameter of the particles. And from this, we can then test if indeed we have a microscope that is absorption based compared to a microscope that is scattering based. And indeed, when we fit the measured uh, values, we get a very nice agreement with the curve that scales with the diameter to the power of three. And we really measure the absorption and not scattering. Indeed, actually, we measure uh, the absorption in a quantitative way. And uh, this uh, brought us to the next project here, where we were depositing gold nanostructures with focused induced electron beam uh, Focus electron beam induced deposition, FEBIT. Basically, uh, how this works is we take an E beam, a substrate. We have here a gas injection system, which floods the area where the E beam is hitting the substrate with a precursor molecule. And this precursor molecule contains a gold atom. When the molecule is here hit by the, the electrons, it decomposes uh, into volatile compounds only the gold is left behind and deposits where we focus the, the E-beam. So that, this allows us to deposit um, arbitrary gold structures on, on surfaces. When we then scanned these gold structures uh, with, our, uh, uh, with our 633 nanometer laser, we could, we could pick up a faint signal here. We know that the deposited gold is highly contaminated with carbon. So there is actually a method how to purify the gold. And this is by injecting um, water, vapor, and then again, scanning with the E beam. And this helps to that the, the carbon binds uh, to, to, to oxygen and basically creates CO2 that is then um, moving out and being um, pumped out by the vacuum pump. And this creates a more pure gold nanostructure. And indeed, if we take the same structures now and we scan them again, we get actually a significant en enhancement of the signal. If we then, we deposit many different structures with various uh, so nanodicks with, with various radii. And here on the y-axis, we plotted the measured absorption cross-sections of these FEBIT deposited gold structures. And we can see that before uh, the purification, we got a um, lower signal, uh, lower cross-sections, and after purification, a larger signal. So basically, we went then and uh, modeled our really contaminated gold with a <clears throat> with, with um, a model that assumed uh, that uh, the matrix has a contamination and we were then able to pick to to fit our our model to the measured data and pull out uh, some atomic um, percent of carbon that has to be present in these gold structures in order to produce the measured absorption cross section and here from the fit we got a value of 20 percent uh, of carbon for the purified and about 65% for the as deposited structures. When you compare to EDX reference measurements, we can see that for the purified well, uh, structures, we got a very accurate uh, value of uh, with the 20%, which agrees well with the 21% measured with EDX. 
but there's quite a big discrepancy between the EDX value of 44% to the 65% that we uh, measured. The difference comes from the fact that the model that we used assumes a slight contamination. And of course, at this point, we have it's 44% of carbon versus about 60% uh, of gold. We can no longer talk about the contamination, but rather a mixture. So the, the simply the model was failing at this point. So we moved on uh, because we were really limited with our uh, commercial um, laser scanning Doppler parameter, and we built our own setup, our own absorption-based microscope. Here we can see how this schematically looks. We have a vacuum chamber. We have here our drum resonator. We can see here we have the drum resonator squeezed in between two magnets because we were implementing a uh, electrical transduction scheme that would be able with which we are able to measure the resonance and the resonance detuning of the resonator without an optical uh, system. On this side, we have our objective that's mounted on a scanning stage. And now we have here the possibility to work with uh, multiple light sources. Here, for example, we work with the uh, 633 nanometer diode laser, and we also hooked up a TISAF laser that we can tune from 700 nanometers all the way to 1000 nanometers. We also moved away from the drums to trampolines. You can see here a trampoline. The trampoline has the advantage that is a mixture of the highly sensitive string, but still featuring a large enough center area that allows us to produce scans. And you can also see here, we have some electrodes placed across these trampolines that allows us to electromechanically transduce the structure. You can also see here a little SEM image of such a trampoline. And because we think they look so beautiful, you can see here a beautiful photo of such a trampoline. Uh, you can see silicon chip, the gold leads, and the silicon nitrate trampoline. So for scale, the window in the center here is one by one millimeter. Here we made some tests with gold nanoparticles. Uh, we pushed the particles to align with an AFM tip, so we have something to uh, re uh, recognize. On, on the on the drum, and we are now able. We zoom in here. We are now able to scan finer and finer. So here we we scanned with a with a pitch of 320 nanometers, 160 nanometers, all the way to 80 nanometers, and we are able to uh, create really beautiful photothermal scan images. Here, as a a reference, the same particles that corresponds that course correspond to this scan as an SEM image. We have a really large signal-to-noise ratio, and the larger the signal-to-noise ratio, the more precise we can localize uh, the, the particle. Basically, the more data we have and the higher the signal-to-noise ratio, the more precise we find the center of this Gaussian. And we can see here the resolution of our scan versus our localization precision. And with the smallest and most um, highly resolved scans, we were able to get roughly uh, a three angstrom localization precision for these gold nanoparticles. Now, I want to also talk about not only nanomechanical photothermal microscopy, but as I mentioned before, we did some IR spectroscopy, but I also want to show you how we do photothermal spectroscopy on single particles. Here, for example, we were depositing multicolor fluorescent beads, and then we scanned these beads with two wavelengths, on the one side with green laser, and on the right side uh, red laser. And this allows us now to create or to record hyperspectral images of our samples. We then uh, moved on and deposited near IR dye molecules, Alexa 790, that we can scan with our TISAF laser and we can see here in this uh, figure on the x-axis, the wavelength versus the signal on the y-axis. The blue curve here is the nominal spectrum of the Alexa 790 uh, die. And the orange curve is the curve that we measured from the photothermal signal that we received. So this is not a single uh, molecule yet. These are uh, aggregates of molecules. But it shows that it's possible to do. We also deposited 
gold nanorods. These gold nanorods have a length of about 50 nanometers. They had a glass shell and a localized surface plasma resonance in the longitudinal length uh, uh, orientation here of about 808 nanometers. We deposited, uh, again, uh, gold nanorods, and these are not single rods, but these are multiple rods, and we measured the frequency detuning as a function of the laser wavelength of the ties of laser, and we get this beautiful um, absorption peak with a peak at the nominal value of about 808 nanometers. Since these nanorods have a polarization-dependent uh, absorption, we tested that too. We can see on the left side some particles. They're probably bundles, but oriented, such that they still give a uh, polarization-dependent signal. And here another uh, signal to the right. And you can see how when we move uh, and rotate the polarization of the probing laser, that we actually also get um, uh, a signal here from, from this bundle that's diminishing, while the signal on the left side is increasing. But I would really like to move on and show you a little bit our vision, where we want to go in the future. And this is, of course, a single molecule spectroscopy. This is a scan from our work uh, with the uh, ATO-633 dyes. And when we take a cross-section across such a Gaussian signal, we can uh, we see that we get a relatively large signal-to-noise ratio. In this case, we got a signal-to-noise ratio of uh, above 70 for a single molecule. And uh, we believe this is uh, enough to actually uh, measure a lot of uh, interesting samples and even perform spectroscopy, absorption spectroscopy on individual molecules. So we had previously a relative responsivity of about 560,000 per watt. And this is given by this gray box here in this table. We see here, this is the dye we measured at 633 nanometers. That this dye has a molar attenuation coefficient of around 130,000 per mole per centimeter. And uh, it has a relatively uh, low heat dissipation ratio because it has a high quantum yield. It's made to fluoresce and not to heat up. And if we then divide this value by 70, we can estimate our current sensitivity which corresponds to a molar attenuation coefficient of roughly 2,000 per mole per centimeter. So this is below, clearly way below some proteins, which have a molar attenuation coefficient of around 190,000 per mole per centimeter for BSA at the amide one band here, or even below some other proteins. But we are still about one order of magnitude above the signal that would be created by a single peptide bond. And in order to be able to resolve single peptide bonds, which would be a measure and also an identification tool uh, for proteins, uh, because it scales with the numbers of proteins, we have to improve our sensitivity. Here, then we went a little bit into studying what is actually limiting us. And we can see here on the left side, this is the responsivity that we measured for drums that were coated with aluminum. And we know that the cell, a drum responsivity does not scale with drum size. And indeed, we can see that we get a flat response for various drum sizes. However, for the pure silicon nitro drums, we could see that indeed, we get actually a deterioration of the responsivity for larger drums. And the effect is that larger drums start to be affected by thermal radiation. The thermal radiation basically lowers the temperature in the center of the drum. You can see here, this is the, the temperature field over the drum. And this is for a, a, a constant absorbed power for various emissivities of the drum. And you can see if there's, the drum does not has a zero emissivity, basically we get the, the largest temperature increase and hence the largest signal. If the emissivity of the drum increases, the temperature in the center of the drum is decreased and hence the signal is decreased. For a string, we can model this straightforward. We can see here there's the responsivity. And we have here two terms. We have one term due to the radiative heat transfer and one term due to the thermal conduction. 
And when we plot now this relative responsivity as a function of the string length, we can see that on the left side, we get this linear response. So it means the longer the string, the larger the responsivity, then we are in the conductive regime. But at some point, we enter the radiative regime and the responsivity gets worse. One way to overcome this effect is to cool down already at, at the temperature of, uh, of, of liquid nitrogen. We can actually improve the responsivity by a factor of 10. I see uh, my time is up and I'm also done now. So I would like to, and I hope I convinced you today that nanomechanical photothermal microscopy is a promising platform for single molecule analysis. And um, we are working on our vision to create single molecule spectroscopy in the future. There's still a long way uh, to this goal, but I'm sure that my team will master this and uh, most of the data and all of the data has been created by this great team. I would like to highlight Miao, who has been uh, spearheading this um this work we uh, contributed have also i mean uh, as, uh mustafa shavraf costas canelopoulos is working on continuation right now robert has supported all the uh, activities uh, strongly niklas has contributed paolo henrik uh, marcus uh, everybody basically has been contributing and figuring out another puzzle piece to finish the whole puzzle and I would also like to acknowledge, of course, our collaborators, the biophysics group of Professor Gerhard Schütz. And with that, I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this was a very nice talk with a beautiful photothermal images. So if there is any questions, just write in the chat or you can ask uh, directly. I, I would probably have a short question also on the perspective. I, I mean, um, what about uh, coupling to oscillators? I mean, there are reports about sensitive detection where you couple two oscillators, one with a loss, one with a gain, where you can drive the system to exceptional points, for example, and things like that, and to improve the um, uh, sensitivity even more, uh, probably close to these points. There are some uh, endeavors uh, for mass sensing where people are now apply uh, optomechanical tools uh, for higher frequency uh, resolution. Basically, we have this, the responsivity we really understand of the system. Where we still have some, where we still have some questions uh, is where does the, which noise limits us in the end? So the ultimate noise limit that we can envision right now is actually the exchange of photons, thermal photons with the environment uh, and the sensor itself who emits photons, which creates the, the ultimate noise. But we have to really right now figure out what is limiting us right now in the frequency resolution. Okay, okay I think uh, Dandal has a question, please. Hi, Sylvan. Uh, again, thanks for this great, great talk. Um, uh, I have a question about um, scaling to uh, infrared measurements. So if you go from you know, 600 nanometer pump to six micron pump, uh, you, know, you can't focus your beam down as tightly. Um, so your intensity goes down. So great, you get a more powerful laser. You, you, know, you can get your intensity back up. Um, if I'm doing uh, a, a fluorescence measurement, for example, then my, my background goes up as well. Um, uh, and I wanted to know if, if you still see that, or because your nitride film is so transparent, you basically don't pay a penalty. Uh, can you talk talk a bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is highly transparent, uh, especially in the visible range, um, where we of course get the background signal, and we also get uh, some which we can. Well, it, it's simply there. It's relatively constant. So, but uh, we deal with the same issues all others work. Uh, in the IR, the problem is more severe because especially silicon at around uh, the, the thermal um, thermal radiative peak at 10 micrometers, silicon nitride has a an absorption, which is quite significant. So we have a window from about 10 to about maybe 12 micrometers that is not accessible really. But uh, above and beyond, below, uh, the, 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 the background is rather low. Thank you. 
Okay, Michel has a question. Michel, please. Yeah, I had a, a short question, uh, two questions actually. One about the temperature distribution in the uh, in the resonator that this you showed uh, in your uh, you know next to last graph. Uh, so I imagine now that this uh, temperature distribution is not very sensitive to the exact position of the heating spots. So that the, uh, the the responsivity is actually more or less flat in the center of uh, of the, the structure, of the membrane or or the string. Is that correct? Uh, for a string, it is basically linear. So in the it's a linear relationship between sensitivity, responsivity, uh, and okay. position. Uh, with a with a drum, it's a it's a logarithmic uh, function. The good thing about the trampolines, the trampolines are quite steady in the center. We have a big area where we have a very constant absorption. There is time enough for the heat to diffuse quickly in the resonator before before you measure. And I have a second technical question. So you show that you can tune the the, the stiffness with uh, chemically by by oxidizing the the, the substrate. Uh, how about do it do, doing it uh, mechanically? Is it possible? And uh, are there advantages to that? Yes, this is possible. We also have tried that. We, we, it's possible to perforate the structure so in such a way that the stress is released. But very often, this has also the effect that um, the responsivity, even though the stress is low, the responsivity is, gets, it gets worse too. It, 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 there's always a trade-off. And, and how about uh, deforming the, the, the substrate? Yes, the so there are, I, I know people, what people do is, for example, you, one designs, okay, in, for example, break junctions, for with, example with, a, people... with a curve already. Yeah. When it's released, it's stretched, but to a lesser extent. That's a possibility. So it's fabricated with lithography with a bend already, and then it stretches, but the, the, the effective stress in the end is lower. It's also possible to create frames which counteract the stress. So it's possible, for example, to deposit oxides on top in a frame that pushes it together. But can't you deform, like, like deforming your guitar, right, to make it, uh, you know, a little bit uh, curved? Ah, the, the to, whole chip. To, to lose, yes, exactly. Like yes, people yes. do in uh, in break junctions, you know. Yeah, it, it is possible. There, are, people have made some some tests. Also, this is more regarded to uh, the damping dilution uh, study that has happened with silicon nitride strings. It's possible, but it's only possible with strings because one need to. Uh, yeah, we can bend in one direction. It's really hard to do it biaxially. It's easier to do it one axially. It's possible, yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, there is a question from Professor Kobiasi, please. Okay, so we don't hear him. Uh, I think I, I have a very short question uh, about the uh, absorption spectra measurements. And you use the broadband laser for excitation. So that means you need a calibration method to calibrate uh, laser intensity at different wavelengths. Or do you use any special technique or to correct? Uh, yes, often we first measure a blank. First measure blank and then subtract it. Alternatively, it's possible, of course, to um, get a beam splitter in and uh, measure the intensity, usually per wavelength, and then correct automatically on the fly. But we usually work with blanks. Yeah, OK, thank you. I think Professor Kovias is still there. Can you please ask? Yeah, I have two questions. One is, the how about the, you talked about the several systems, and how are the uh, Q factor of the resonator you're using. There are several of them you mentioned. And the second question is, uh, is it possible to enhance sensitivity by utilizing higher order mode of the uh, resonator? Yes. Um, is the, in a sense, nonlinear regime. Yes, exactly. So indeed, uh, yeah, higher order modes are beneficial. Usually we did our best measurements with higher order modes. Also in our models, the higher order modes have a higher sensitivity. Um, with regard to the quality factor, the quality factor is very important for force sensing. It is not as important for us. It helps us to get a good signal, uh, to, to measure, to easily measure the, the, the frequency. But it actually falls out of the equation. If we can drive the signal to the onset of nonlinearity and we can resolve the thermomechanical noise peak, the Q factor no longer plays a role in the frequency noise. Hmm. So it is below 
the noise noise level you mean no it's just that uh, the quality factor um increases the the, the noise peak uh and it, it also um so it has multiple effects um in, in the frequency fluctuations so the frequency fluctuation inversely scales with q so the larger q the lower frequency noise but then also the signal to noise ratio plays a role and there in the end when we put all together the quality factor falls out so the quality factor is not that important but we still we have a few hundred thousand still so it's still a lot but it's yeah. actually not we, we don't focus it at it at all it's not important to us in case of uh, string you mean uh, which, which system uh, oh string. strings and trampolines yes trampoline and also string yes yes the values are very high it makes it easy to work with them but uh, it's not something we focus on. It's not important to us. Okay, thank you.